Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. You silly sod. Oh, you got us all worked up. And Big Anklevich. You tit. I saw my arm and I was so scared. Look. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. And here we are again. Here we are. Uh, that feels like that should be a song, like the intro to the starting of a song. Oh, boy. But I can't think of what it would be. Here we are again. No, not that. The Doonstief Audio Fiction <laughs> Magazine. <laughs> All right. It's me and Big Ant Clovis. Well, yes, we're here again, and we've got another story for you all. Hopefully you're ex- as excited about it as we are, because we just can't wait. Okay. I've heard that about you. <laughs> yeah, today we've got a story by Monsieur Greg Chamberlain. You can call him Monsieur because he comes from Ontario. Oh, wait. It's uh, Quebec. That he would be Monsieur. So, Mr. Greg Chamberlain. And the story is called Bunnies of the Apocalypse. Indeed it is. That is. I feel like you were waiting for me to throw in my two cents. Well, I didn't want to only me talk, you know. <laughs> I'm just going and uh, I, I figured I'd let you at least, you know, remind the, the listeners that you're here. About the author. Greg Chamberlain is a community newspaper reporter, four decades in the trade, who lives in rural Ontario, Canada with his missus and their trio of cats who allow the humans to think they are in charge. Bunnies Bunnies of of the the Apocalypse apocalypse originally appeared in Weird Book Magazine 34 in 2017. His other oddball and also a few serious stories in the science fiction, fantasy, and weird fiction genres are available at the Daily Science Fiction website, online at Aries, and Sci-Fi Journal Magazines, and that's Sci-Fi with a P-H-I, I believe that might be because it's philosophy involved in those science stories. In past issues of Apex, Mythic, non-binary review and pulp literature magazines among others and in various original anthologies including nothing sacred four the dragon lord's library and third flat irons cats breakfast anthology that last name is a mouthful i i i want to know more about third flat irons cats breakfast anthology there's two possessives in there so the cats belong to the flat irons and then the breakfast belongs to the cats i think and those same cats allow greg to believe that he is in charge that's right while hitting him over the head with a flat iron now and then just to remind him that that's not actually the case probably boy that's know. rough man <laughs> Life is pretty hard for an Ottawa. Yes, yes. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump on into the story and let you guys listen to that, and then we'll be back with more on the other side. Merci beaucoup. Ottawa, remember. Oh, right, right. Thank you, Pip. Bunnies of the Apocalypse by Greg Chamberlain. There's no point in shouting or screaming for help, said Mr. Seltzer. No one can hear you. Little Kiri stared, wide-eyed, as the kindly-looking old man reached into a battered top hat. His arm went in up past the elbow, he drew out a big, wickedly sharp-looking knife. Its shiny blade gleamed in the flickering candlelight. Seeing the child's astonished look, Mr. Seltzer smiled. Hmm, a useful little gift from my patron, he said, twirling the hat around on a finger. 
Imagine what the Dark Lord will give me in exchange for you. He pointed with the tip of the knife at the chalk outline of a pentagram on the floor. Now, be a good little sacrifice and step inside. Mind you don't smudge any of the lines, else it will prove unpleasant for you. And I'll just redraw the pentagram anyway. Kiri took one reluctant step towards the pentagram. Without warning, the child darted aside, at the same time leaping towards Mr. Seltzer. Grabbing at the hat, Kiri snatched it from the surprised old man's grasp. Landing a couple of child-sized paces away, Kiri ran the short distance to the door at the other side of the room. It was locked. The child spun around, one hand automatically reaching inside the hat. Seltzer smiled and scoffed. <laughs> what do you think you are going to do with my hat? Pull a rabbit out? Desperate and despairing, while the still smiling Satanist sneered and watched, Kiri fumbled around inside the hat. Eyes widened with sudden hope as big, furry fingers gripped a child-sized hand. Kiri tugged and pulled a rabbit out of the hat, a six-foot-tall rabbit that stood balanced upright on its backward-kneed legs. The red-furred creature looked like a rabbit version of Conan the Barbarian, muscles bulging up and down its legs and arms. One almost-human hand still grasped Kiri's, while the rabbit's other hand took quick possession of the hat. The man-sized rabbit winked an eye at Kiri, then turned towards Mr. Seltzer, who was still holding his knife, but standing open-mouthed now with shock. Good eye, my the rabbit said. The Satanist blinked. Good day, mate? A pink nose twitched in amusement. You were expecting maybe what's up, dog, or something? The strange creature let go of Kiri's hand. Excuse us out for my little bit, okay? A large paw pushed the child protectively to one side and behind the big rabbit. It held up the top hat. Oi! It called into the mouth of the brim. Shake a paw, you lot! We got a job to do and no mistake, all right? Turning the hat right side up and holding it high, the rabbit gave a couple of sharp raps against the flat top. Out the open bottom end tumbled one, two, three more rabbit creatures, equal in size to the first, but all differing in appearance. One was a gray-furred female, skinny to the point of emaciation. Legs like narrow, knotted tree limbs supported an anorexic body all bumpy with the ribs sticking out. At the end of twig-thin arms, bony fingers snatched and grabbed at empty air. Sharp, white buck teeth in the death's head skull gleamed in the candlelight. Another member of the trio had sickly yellow, mange-ridden hair with leprous gray skin showing in patches where the fur had fallen out. Feverish yellow eyes turned their burning gaze on Mr. Seltzer. Without thinking, he took an instinctive step back, bringing up his knife. A scabrous nose wrinkled up in amused response. The last one of the creatures stood tall and silent like a midnight furred shadow. Cataract white eyes stared at the Satanist, who quailed beneath their chill regard. Right then, said the blood red rabbit. Introductions are in order. A furry thumb jerked towards its broad chest. I'm War. Mr. Seltzer gaped. War continued speaking. This darling here is Famine. Wouldn't stand too close to her just now, mind. She's feeling a might peckish. Famine's hungry eyes took their measure of Mr. Seltzer. Her sharp white teeth snapped. You might have guessed. This ugly mug's plague. Fever bright eyes stared. Rotting lips revealed a pair of blackened buck teeth. Brains? Well, I guess we know now what's the disease of choice for today, eh? War indicated the remaining member of the quartet. 
big and quiet, he is deaf. If you didn't know already. But his friends call him Harvey. Death's paw-like hands flexed. Bone-white sickle claws snicked out of the fingertips. Mr. Seltzer took a quick step back into the pentagram. Bending down, he swiftly scratched several symbols inside each of the five angles. Straightening, he said with smug satisfaction, I don't know who or what you are, but you cannot harm me. He pointed the knife tip at the pentagram and its new additions. Not now that I have protection. War's ears twitched. He snorted. That's where you're wrong, you stupid drongo. All four rabbit creatures advanced as one on the quaking Satanist. War held up the top hat. We're taking you back with us for a little meet and greet with your boss. All in one piece, or in pieces. Your choice, Yob. Mr. Seltzer fell to his knees. The forgotten knife sagged in his fingers. But... He gabbled. But it's my hat. My hat. How could that child use my hat? Kisk answered War, spinning the hat around on one furry finger. It's just a simple old trick, is all. Crimson eyes narrowed as a scarlet hair lip split in a buck-toothed grin. Everyone knows. Tricks of a kids. Author's Note Hi, this is Greg Chamberlain with the story behind the story of Bunnies of the Apocalypse. Bunnies of the Apocalypse began with the title, which came to me while I was spending a Saturday's winter morning shoveling snow out of my driveway. Now, I've long given up trying to figure out how my brain thinks, or where my mind goes when it wanders off sometimes. All I know is that I am pushing a load of snow to the side when the words, Bunnies of the Apocalypse, pops into my head. So I smile at the thought, let it sit there until I finish with the snow and then go back inside. Then I just sat down on the couch with my pad and pen and scribbled out the first draft of the story within about half an hour's time. If it's based on anything, it's from watching too much classic cartoons when I was a child, later a teenager, and even now as an adult, especially the kind of funny animal cartoons that spoof society and culture. And besides... Who isn't a fan of mutant superhero funny animals anyways? Hmm? And that's the story behind the story. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dean Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hope you enjoyed the story. I know I did. Did you? I did. You know, I sort of sprung this one on you. <laughs> I don't know that you... I gave you a choice. Well... I don't know that I give you a choice at all as to whether we continue to do the show. It just is like, <laughs> hey, we've got another episode. No, yeah, it was a fun story. You know what I just realized? We we totally missed the opportunity to bring out Bruce again because this is a story that should have had Bruce and Bruce introing <laughs> the story because I, we, we had Australian bunnies of the apocalypse. Uh, yeah, I mean, back when we uh, had... Our Ernie Pine stories, we would always intro with Bruce and Bruce, so uh, I feel like we totally blew it. But that's all right. We can just s soldier on. I feel like we lost a significant portion of our viewership, listenership rather, every time we did that dueling Bruce's. That's probably true. We at least lost all of our Australian <laughs> listenership each time we did that. So maybe it's better that we retire it. Oh, see, now I want to bring it back. Um, so tell us a, a little bit the history of this uh, acquiring of the story. How did you come across the story, Monsieur Richoutfield, since you are from Quebec? Well, he, he said in his, uh, or sorry, you said in your About the Author that this story appeared in Weird Book 34. Yes. And uh, I got a copy of Weird Book. 34 because 
a story by Rish Outfield was published in that. And oh. yeah, it's the uh, final story in the magazine. Uh, and it's my, my Halloween story trick, which uh, I, I, you know, I don't think is, is great, but I guess they, they thought it was good enough. Well, you thought it was good enough to submit it. Uh, I mean, something, right? I, but yeah, I, I, I have no idea. I must have lost hold of my senses, as they say. You were out of your tiny little mind at the time. Anyhow, one of these things when you sell a story to a magazine is that they will give you... Boy, what do they call it? Is it contributor's copies? Yes, I believe they call that a contributor's copy. And I got a couple of those, and uh, I had it with me, and I thought, oh, I'm going to take that with me on uh, on vacation. I'm going to just throw it in a in my backpack, and whenever I get a few minutes, I will read the other stories that are in there. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I did... And I found this one, even as short as it is, I found it really amusing and felt like it would lend itself to audio. You know what I mean? It's sort of the one-two punch. Every once in a while, you'll find a story where it's like, oh, we'd like to do that on the show, but that's not going to work in audio. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's great for audio. (laughs) There was another uh, story in there that, that I liked. And I thought, oh, okay, we'll get Renee Chambliss to do an English accent, so you know, because that'll be nice. <laughs> and then I got to the end of the story, and I was like, oh, oh, they had me and they lost me. No. Oh. But as far as this one went, I looked Greg up on the internet after reading that story, and sure enough, he had a website and a way to contact him. And I asked him if he would uh, let us do it on the show, and. Uh, He told me where I could put my podcast. But then, later, he discovered that Andromeda Spaceways in-flight magazine doesn't have a podcast. And so he said, yeah, okay, you can run it. Which I think was pretty great. For us, and not so much for Andromeda Spaceways. Yeah, I guess it's good that I sabotaged their attempts to launch a a podcast then. Yeah, they once asked me to narrate like all their first 10 episodes and I said, okay. And then I just never did and I didn't turn them into them and they kept asking for them and then... uh, Eventually they stopped. I think I've said too much. I mean, yeah, it's good that we got got his his story. (laughs) It was a fun tale. So he said in his author's note that it was somehow fueled by... By cartoons from the uh, from the olden days, from cartoons like I don't know, I, I got the feeling when he was saying it that it was cartoons like I don't know Tom and Jerry, or more so maybe the old Bugs Bunny cartoons. Considering this is Bunnies of the Apocalypse, yeah, there did seem to be a loony aspect to this. Yeah, you had the bunnies, and you know he he talked about the. The cartoons that spoofed on society. And that seemed like a really big thing of those old Warner Brothers cartoons is their, uh, the satire, I guess, or or whatever it was. You got a lot of that uh, in their cartoons. I suppose maybe that's a thing that still goes on. I don't know. Does, Does SpongeBob satire society? You watch a lot of SpongeBob. No, but I would think that south park does or rick and morty does or these these cartoons that are aimed more for adults than for kids and i think that probably the looney tunes were aimed at an older audience than maybe the walt disney cartoons yeah that could be true while including enough cartoon violence to keep the uh the little ones happy as they watched uh Wiley Coyote get a rock dropped on him once again. Or Elmer Fudd get his comeuppance for trying to hunt Bugs Bunny. Ain't he a stinker? Now, in this case, we've we've got a Satanist getting his comeuppance. Yeah, I that's probably the reason I wanted the story, isn't it? I just and, and you got to voice him too, which made me jealous. Just, <laughs> he was gonna sacrifice this child to his arcane ritual and How could I not like a story like that? (laughs) How could you? 
Everyone loves child sacrifices to arcane rituals, right? No, no, I think just me. Oh, oh, I guess I... We now lost half of our non-Australian listeners. <laughs> I misgaged our audience again, dang it. Yeah, I, I, I guess you wouldn't see something like that in a cartoon, in a Looney Tunes cartoon, but you would probably see a witch that wanted to eat the child or something like that, you know? Yeah, I believe that I've seen uh, that cartoon. And, you know, the fun part, too, is that you always got, you know, you had that bad guy, like Elmer Fudd or Wile E. Coyote. It, it often was somebody who wanted to eat <laughs> our character. Sylvester, the cat. Right, yeah, Sylvester wants to eat Tweety. Uh, Elmer Fudd's gonna shoot and eat the rabbit, I assume. Uh, Wiley Coyote wants to eat the Roadrunner, etc., etc. It's a lot of nature red in tooth of, and claw in those uh, Warner Brothers cartoons. But yeah, and we we got to just sit and enjoy the little guy turning the tables on the big baddie, as they say in Australia. And that's, I guess, uh, a lot of what we got in this one, you know. You got a little kid who steals the hat, pulls a bunch of rabbits out that turn out to be the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, Big Batty ha has no protection against them or their accents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that had to have been the... The clincher of the deal for you is the, the accent for the rabbit, right? I do quite enjoy doing that kind of stuff. I don't know why. It wasn't too long ago we did a public service announcement in which I was supposed to be myself, and you were the Hulk. And when we recorded originally, I also got to be the voice of, is it Korg? Is that what his name is? Yeah, you remember Korg? And I was sad... In the end, because we got a, a real New Zealander to do his voice. And I had fun doing Korg. Although, you know, I, I can't complain. Gino Moretto did a great job. And Gino Moretto sounds better than me. But yeah, I do love to do uh, accents and things like that. Although I'm not necessarily good at it. I think uh, that's much more your wheelhouse than mine. Well, I don't know. Your Korg was pretty dang good. Oh, yeah, you think so? I thought my Korg sounded more like a Corgi. Mm. But uh, that's just me. So, the accents aside, the horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen, um, boy, we see a lot of depictions of them in media. And it, it seems like it's lately that we see a lot of that stuff. I, I don't know, maybe people treaded a lot lighter in the past about those things. But why is it that people are so fascinated by the four horsemen of the apocalypse? I think they're just a really interesting image. And also just the idea of an apocalypse probably scares a lot of people. You know what I mean? Just the, uh, it's like how much do people worry about death? You know, it's something that's out there and you know, it's coming. So people are kind of a little fascinated with that. And uh, I guess apocalypse is a death for everyone, a death of all of society, a big finale. And I think a lot of people just kind of wonder, you know what I mean? Like, uh, is this, is, is there something waiting for me? You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I mean, there's a thousand or more religions out there that are kind of explanations for uh, what is coming down the line. And I guess that's where the four horsemen of the apocalypse come from, is from one of those religions. And it's just, yeah, I, I think that's one of those things that's always on people's mind. You know what I mean? Like, if I make this decision this way or that way, is is there going to be some kind of retribution waiting for me eventually? Will I be the person that the the horseman comes for? I don't know. It's just, it's a, it's a really interesting image. These four horsemen that bring these woes to the world. And a lot of popular culture, like the X-Men or stuff like that, will rely on, you know, m legends and myths and stuff. So they'll, they'll bring in 
uh, I don't know, Hercules is a character in Marvel Comics, and Thor is a character in Marvel Comics. So, And, shoot, they even have what? Angela? Satan? Wasn't Satan a character in Marvel Comics? Well, they're different Marvel devils. Uh, there's Mephisto is is the most famous of those, but but yeah, there is a Satan, you know, uh, father of uh, Damien Hellstrom. Yeah, didn't Spider Man do a deal with the devil to get Aunt May back? Or? Well, with Mephisto, but yes. Oh, was Mephisto we, in that case? We don't we don't talk about that benighted story <laughs> in this dojo. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Why do you think people are interested in the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse in particular? Well, I, I, I understand them being fascinated with the end of the world and all that, but uh, I never heard stories about the four horsemen of the apocalypse when I was a kid. All of that stuff was, it went beyond religious dogma and became something akin to fantasy to elves and dragons and that kind of stuff. It just, it was so out there. And I think that that's part of why it is, it, the, the, these characters are interesting and, and that stories are told over and over again with the, them taking different forms. The, these four aspects of the dark side of life, I suppose, and, and a being representing each one of them, you know, somebody that represents famine, somebody that represents disease, the, the, the personification of that, of death, that stuff is totally, totally fascinating to me. I don't know. I don't know if it's not fascinating to other people, but yeah, just the idea. Uh, and we did a story about death and it wasn't at Michelle Jenkins, him, him, him going out with yes, her. Yes, death of Michelle Jenkins, I believe. And, and that idea of the reaper, of the angel of death, of a person that comes to claim your soul or whatever is just so, well, I, I guess it's fascinating or, or maybe it's um, terrifying, the idea that that would come for you. And every society, every religion has something like that, but, uh. The, the skull-faced one with the scythe that um, culturally we are super familiar with is just really, really cool. I mean, think of how many album covers you saw that on in the 80s. <laughs> you know, he's a, a pop culture icon beyond just being a religious icon. Um, when I went down to Mexico this year, there were all these uh, vendors selling various sculptures out of bone they were made from bone and uh, i was asking them if like oh i would like a grim reaper carved out of bone i mean that seems if ironic is the word that's applicable in this case that's what it seems and they they would bring out these sexy big boobed skeleton women and I'd be like, well, yeah, yeah, that, that's quite arousing, actually. But no, what I want <laughs> is the one with the hood and the sickle and, you know, the skull face. And I finally had a guy, a, a Mexican vendor, tell me, well, the reason we don't have what you're looking for is that the real angel of death is female. I was just like, oh, thanks, man. It was just one of those weird culture shock things where it's just like, oh, the the real angel of death. Oh, well, the real one. Oh, see, I haven't met the real one. I, yeah. I, I've only met the uh, the mall Santas so far. <laughs> um, eventually, I did get one. And if we had episode art, I guess I could show you a picture of the the Reaper that I bought that's, that's carved out of bone. I don't know. I, I guess that's sort of a... A sidetrack, but I, I find the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse in a fantasy, unreal, made-up character setting really interesting. Yeah, the Four Horsemen is one of those things that, that comes up again and again. I mean, I've loved the idea 
I suppose the first time I'd ever heard of them was there was a uh, group of football players, and I believe they played for Notre Dame that they called the Four Horsemen of Notre Dame. But I didn't really know anything about them because they played like in the 30s or the 20s or some sometime way, way back when, when, you know, they won one for the Gipper and stuff like that. <laughs> I just heard the nickname before. I didn't really know who they were other than that they were just a bunch of running backs, I believe. I don't know. But uh, Metallica has a song called The Four Horsemen. And of course they do. <laughs> that has to be one of my favorite songs of all that they've ever done because the rhythm to that song the whole time sounds like horses' hooves running along it goes dun da 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 like that the whole way through underneath I don't know I just loved it it's always been one of my favorite Metallica songs. You ought to write a story inspired by that song. Yeah I should. I should base a story on a Metallica song title. Maybe I'll do that. You ought to try it too. Oh, oh, no, no, no. That sounds like something you would actually do and I would just talk about. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to think of other uh, incarnations. It feels like everything has his four horsemen. I can't think of other examples other than Apocalypse from the X-Men who had his four horsemen. Well, Terry Pratchett has written about the four horsemen of the Apocalypse and... Uh, Douglas Adams, and uh, I remember the, that really, really awful movie that people liked called uh, Now You See Me. Those four magicians were called the Four Horsemen. Oh, on the, the TV series Supernatural, we met the, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and uh, to stave off the Apocalypse, the uh, brothers had to kill all four to prevent uh, the, the end of the world from happening. I thought that was pretty cool. Hmm, interesting. Oh, maybe they didn't have to kill them. They had to get... They each wore a ring. And if you defeated them or killed them, then you, they could take the ring and you'd use that to stop the apocalypse. And yeah, spoiler alert, we're still here. Oh, you spoiled it. I was just thinking I'd watch that show, but now I'm not interested anymore. Uh -oh. well, you're missing out. It's pretty cool. And they're, they're, those boys are dreamy. <laughs> You didn't give me enough time between saying spoiler alert and then spoiling it to plug my ears and say la la la. Uh, have you ever done that? <laughs> no. Uh, but there are times then I've thought I ought to. I do watch most football games on tape delay. Because basically I watch it on a program. And I hadn't realized yet that I just needed to change the settings and tell it to stop showing me the final scores of the games on the main page. Once I finally realized, oh, I bet you there's a setting, and I turned that off, then my life got much easier uh, as far as that goes. But yeah, I would have to navigate the program with my peripheral vision, because <laughs> the final scores would be there. But I didn't want to watch the game if I already knew who won. And so I would like, try and click through it looking sideways at the screen so I could kind of see that's the symbol of like the Buffalo Bills and that's the symbol of the Minnesota Vikings okay that's the one and now I got to get it to the condensed game because I don't want to sit and watch them do all the slow stuff but that was basically my version of going la 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 while I uh, clicked through that keep myself from having that ruined mostly I just try and avoid things like, if, say, Avengers 4 is coming up, then I'll just avoid anything that has to do with it so that I don't get things spoiled on me. I don't know why that's such a thing. Like, why people want to spoil things so much. I don't know, man. One last thing I want to say about this story, and thank you, Greg, for letting us run it. The, the last line of the story. <laughs> I feel like... Technically, the whole story is just building up to that line. Although I think the story still works without it. But I could see somebody being like, oh, dude, that was not cool. Because it, it borders on being a pun. I don't know that it exactly <laughs> achieves that. But yeah, it, it sort of walks in the neighborhood. And I wondered when I was editing it, 
if, like, you know, you mentioned Gino before, if, if people not from here, not from North America, will get that line, is, is, that, oh, right. is that something that everybody, every English-speaking person recognizes that tricks are for kids? Yeah, I wonder if that is a slogan that was used around the world, because not all products appear everywhere. Uh, does General Mills sell tricks in other countries, or is it just Weedabix? Oh my um, gosh! Did you just say Weedabix? You filthy <laughs> piece of crap! Certain things rise to the level of everybody knows it, whether you know it or not. You know what I mean? Like you don't really know the context behind it, but you know the idea. And then other things just don't. And it's hard to know what those things are and what they aren't. You know, yeah, you can't know unless you actually have lived in Australia and find out, oh, yeah, everybody knows that tricks are for kids well, that's, uh, thing. Okay, so, so if people wouldn't mind letting us know if the tricks rabbit is iconic enough that you are familiar with him, if you're not American or a Canadian. I wouldn't have guessed that Canadians knew, but I guess they're, they're, they're like us enough that you were able to breed with one. <laughs> so on the genetic <laughs> level, they're really close. Yes, that is true. <laughs> there are things that you can get in Canada and can't get here and can't get in Canada, but can get here, etc., they have a great deal of Cadbury candy that we just don't have here. I'm not sure why. Cancer and lab animals. And pretty much that's the only stuff that I really care about is candy. So I don't know what else they have that we don't have. Unfortunately, Justin Bieber is not one of those things. <laughs> only of available in Canada. <laughs> but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I would like to know... Uh, and if you, if there's other things you know that are that are like that, things that have risen to the level of everybody knows it because you speak English, and other things where you're like, oh, I heard somebody say this, and I had no idea what they were talking about, and they had to explain it to me, and then I was like, oh, freaking American, or whatever, you know, that would be cool to hear about it too. That that that, that kind of stuff really interests me. Okay, well, but what about an Irishman, an Irish person? And Lucky the Leprechaun. Yeah, Lucky Charms. Is that something where they're just like, oh, you bastards. Yeah. Yeah, you dirty American bastards. Why do you have to take, or why do you have to culturally appropriate? Why do you say I'm magically delicious every time I talk to you? Why do you laugh whenever I talk in this accent? Why do you say Saint and Begora? <laughs> I've never said that. Nobody says that. Yeah, that kind of stuff is really uh, interesting to me. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but uh, I love that kind of stuff. So yeah, if you have any uh, example, that would be awesome. Share it with us in the in the Facebook post or the comments or or wherever you like uh, on the forum, wherever you like to share your stories with the Dune Steve. Please interact. Yeah, I, I, it would be cool if, if a single person obeyed what you just suggested. <laughs> It'd be cool if a single person cared enough to get off their fat, swollen, un-American arses. Whoa, 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 whoa. So thanks for listening to the story, everybody. <laughs> well, and yes, thank you, Greg, for sending it our way. Yeah, I, I got a kick out of it. I hope a lot of people did, too. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. We got an episode in in, uh, in November. That was kind of in doubt for a while, right? It was very close to not happening, yeah. Um, which is sad, but uh, what are you going to do? Well, there, that's all the time we have for tonight, uh, folks. <laughs> I, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a strange thing to say, Rish. I, I want you to expand on that just a little bit. No, oh, I don't know. I, don't, I feel weird telling people about it. Uh, you want me to expand on it? Oh, uh, if you want to. Well, okay. No, I mean you've already done. You've already done the the damage. <laughs> I've already pushed you into it. Uh, well, no, I mean you you posted it on Facebook. That is true. And it's just like, oh, well, I guess the uh, genie is out of the bottle now. Is that 
Am I using that phrase correctly? I think you might want to use cat being out of the bag in this particular case. Oh, no. No, we would not want to alienate any of our listeners, especially not Greg, who in lieu of children had three cats and uh, as leaving the majority of his estate to them. They do let him think he's in charge, at least. Yeah, they, uh, he, apparently he got the good ones, the generous ones, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I had a problem with my computer. And maybe this will be amusing to people. Uh, certainly wasn't to me, but, you know, laughing at other people's misfortune is, is something that most people get a kick out of. Yeah, it's the best part of being human. I've had this computer for a long, long time, and... Uh, uh, it froze. It just, it, 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 it just, I, you could say that it crashed, but in my opinion, it, crashing was when, you know, a computer would start over. And this one, it just, it didn't. And so I turned it off and turned it back on, and it said, boot disk not found. And I was like, oh no. And so I turned off the computer again and turned it back on, hoping that that would fix it. It fixes it on, uh, on TV. And it said, boot disk not found, motherfucker. So I called you and I was like, gosh, what am I going to do? And you said, well, I guess you, you, you need to take it to, uh, to get it looked at and get it fixed. And, and, and then I said, oh, no, twice, because I didn't want to do that. I didn't have the <laughs> money to do that. There's a, um, a chain of computer-like sellers and fixers around here. And you remember them from when you lived here because they had the most annoying commercials. Oh, geez. Yes, they do. Uh, it was one of those where they'd like, they took pride in how obnoxious their commercial was because it was like an earworm. Yes, they did. It was like, oh, yeah, you, yes. you hear that near and far, always forever. Yeah, you hear that song <laughs> and you, you want to just gouge out your ears with a, a bottle opener. But yeah, there's no such thing as bad press for that. It's like, yeah, the, the talentless hack that released that song is thrilled to hear that it's in your head. And it was the same way. It was just like, oh yeah, you hate our commercials? I'll bet you remember our name and we're going to keep it up. Let's triple our advertising budget. So I took the computer in. And, and rewarded those people for their awful commercials? But, but what else was I going to do? Just buy a new computer... <laughs> from them or take it to the one place that advertises that we can you know we'll look at your computer we have a free uh what do you call it diagnostic mm -hmm. and so i brought it in and and dude the employee was young like punchline to a joke young he spoke to me the, the way that you would speak to like an old lady that thinks that a gallon of milk costs a quarter or a president who thinks you need like an ID to buy cereal, that kind of stuff. And at one point I asked him how old he was. Because he was just like, he, he, he got out early from junior high to go to this job. And he said... You asked him how old he was and he said, I'm uh, younger than your computer, sir. Oh, well, maybe I told you about this interaction because you knew where this was going. No, I, d I just guessed. Yeah, I, I asked him how old he was and he said old enough, which seems like, in retrospect, a flirt, like something. I, I, I don't know. Ooh, yeah, maybe he was coming um, on to you. But yeah, I, I, I asked him, OK, tell me who the president was when you were born. And he said Al Gore. So, you know, I don't know how old that makes him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Came from a from a different dimension. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's telling me about the Berenstein Bears. <laughs> he so he hooked up my computer to this, like I guess as a diagnostic tool. I I don't know what what it You're was. You're a diagnostic tool. It was some machine, and he was able to get it to boot up, no problem. And I'm I'm con what do you do? I'm condensing the time for this anecdote. But, I mean, this was a, an arduous process in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was able to boot it up, no problem. And as it booted, <laughs> he looked over and he said, oh, my God. And I said, what? And he said, you actually still edit podcasts with audacity? <laughs> uh, but no, no. The reason he said it, he was actually horrified that the hard disk was A, so small, and two... 
96% full. Oh. <laughs> I told him, you know, I, I edit uh, audio in those they're really, really big files and, and all that. And yeah, he just his eyes glazed over because it was just... Uh... I've had my computer for a long time. And to him, it was just like, no, we don't sell parts for an Edsel. <laughs> but he told me, yeah, uh, look, I can... This is an easy fix to get it to boot up. But your computer is on its last leg and it's going to continue to do this. So if you want, I can, you know, give it back to you and you can boot it up at home and transfer all the data off of your hard drive so that you don't lose it. But that's really all I can do. Well, you need to get a new computer, sir. And I don't know if he actually called me sir, but it, there was that sort of that tone to him is like, you know what I mean? It's like you need to fix this headlight, sir. That's right. This is just a warning ticket. No, no, it's not safe for you to ride around with no headlights at all. You need to fix one or both of these things. Is basically the tone he had taken with me. And, and so I was just like, gosh, what, what am I going to do, Mom? Uh, I came home <laughs> and, uh, yes, my mom also worked at the computer repair shop and... Uh, she shook her head at the wild thornberries <laughs> slash fiction. But yeah, I came home and I was like, I, well, I, I don't know what to do. And I, I, I called you <laughs> and you had already posted on Facebook that my friend Rich Outfield is having computer problems. And, uh, you know, if, 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 if you like what we do and want it to continue, please consider donating. I was quoting announcer man there. Yeah, I, I just feel bad. I, I know that you've been having issues recently, and I know that you would probably be irritated with me, but uh, I kind of forced you into uh, asking folks, because I, I mean, I had the same problem several years ago, and we did a fundraiser and raised a bunch of money so that I could replace my computer so that I could keep doing stuff for the show. You know, it's it's... Definitely something that needs to be done. You told me that your computer is like barely younger than our show. It's like eight or nine years old or something like that. And I don't know how it can still function at that age. I mean, the way that things go these days is definitely got to be on its last legs as the uh, child at the computer repair store <laughs> told you. And yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, and we, we actually got donations already from folks. And we, I'd like to thank everybody that donated. You know, we, we get donations here and there from folks uh, that have signed up to do a subscription for the show. You know, we have a little bit built up from that. But yeah, all the donations that we got once I put out that post has almost doubled what we had. And yeah, I just wanted to put out one last... Plea. I know that some people are my friends on Facebook, but I get the feeling that more people uh, listen to the show than are my friends on Facebook. Uh, maybe that's not the case. Maybe less people listen to the show than are my friends on Facebook. But just in case. Yeah, I think I figured, that there are people probably who hate listen to the show. But yeah, I just thought I'd put it out there and, and just ask uh, if you have, you know, just a couple of bucks. It doesn't have to be anything special. Every little bit counts. And uh, we need to get Rish back on his feet as far as this goes because the computer that's gone... You, you still have a crap top, right? I do. Which um, Oddly, with a name like that, it's not a perfect tool for work. Yeah, so it's not, it's not particularly good, but you were able to limp along with it for a while. But the one that went down is basically your workhorse, you know? Yeah, it's the thing that I do the majority of my work on. And so, yeah, that's been frustrating, and I, I guess I, I live in fear of uh, it doing that again, and it won't restart. But I have, yes, transferred all of the data from it that you know that I couldn't do without. I did lose some stuff when the computer went down, but it was just the stuff that I had done the most recently, the you know the last week or so before it died. Uh huh. And so the last 4% that it couldn't manage to, to, <laughs> to ride onto the full hard drive. Maybe that's it. Maybe computers aren't meant to be 
run at 96% capacity. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the case. I'm pretty sure they are not meant to do that. So, you know, you, you keep that in mind in the future. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But uh, again, if I do get a new computer, and thank you for the people that have donated to help me do that, I'm sure when I see how big the hard drive is, I'll be like, oh my goodness, I'll never fill this. Never. <laughs> Until a week later. But I think that that's how I felt when I got this. Is like, oh, this computer will serve me for the rest of my life. And yeah, like a year later, I started to hate it. You know how that is. Yeah. It just... yeah, I remember when I got my first computer and it had a 20 gigabyte hard drive. And I went, holy crap. I could put on like a hundred CDs worth of music on here and have a lot of space left over. And thousands upon thousands of CDs worth of music later. And many years later, <laughs> I think my hard drive has a terabyte. I don't know. it, And that's an old computer. What do they have now? <sighs> Actually, I've heard that uh, they've gotten smaller because they've gone all solid state or something like that. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not smart enough to even know what all that means. Yeah, I, don't ask me, dude. I, I, mine still runs with a pedal. <laughs> like a sewing machine? <laughs> But again, thank you uh, to people that, that feel like donating. And uh, we've really been trying to bring this show back and have an episode a month again. And so uh, if you'd like to see that continue, as the man said, thank you. Yeah, it would be really, uh, really helpful if you could do that. And there's, you know, on our website, dunesteve.com, you can go. We've got a little, uh, there's little buttons on the side panel you can scroll down to and you know you can donate to our paypal account is where all that uh, the donations that are building up to hopefully be able to get rich a spanking new computer ah. wait no no spanking involved come now we're all adults here that's probably the problem in the first place <laughs> all right well thank you for listening all the way to the end of the episode and uh, thank you to Greg Chamberlain for his story and uh, the people who have stuck with us, good times and bad, uh, even those who may be Canadian. <laughs> That's right. I hope you have a good month and we'll see you next time. I'm Big Yankovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And uh, they're great. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. Chalupa for you, Rish. Take two. I don't. Do you, what do you know about that uh, Harry Potter movie that I saw the other day? Do you know anything about it? Well, first of all, there hasn't been a Harry Potter movie in almost a decade. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, Wizarding World movie. Do you, Do you know if Beneath Seathless Skies still exists? I don't, but I could check super fast. Well, yeah, I think it still does exist, I'm afraid, sir. You'll have to come up with something else. Damn it. Because the November 8th issue came out and has... Yeah, there's one that came out on November 8th, one that came out on October 25th. Wow. So, yeah, still exists. Not only exists, but it shames us. Oh, yeah, most things do, though. Oh, okay. Because we are very shameful. And as it booted... <laughs> He looked over and he said, oh my God. And I said, what? And now we'll have a multiple choice of what he said and you get to pick which one was the funniest, okay? Okay. He said, you actually still edit podcasts with audacity? <laughs> Two, 
he said, oh, you're a big fan of that porn of girls with monsters too. <laughs> Three, he said, your computer actually needs an external modem for internet? After which I threw up my hands and said, oh my God, too. Uh, that's not a joke. <laughs> Four, he said, a colony of wood sprites has built a nest in your hard drive. <laughs> Number five, he said, your processor is so outdated, it said it was built in West Germany. <laughs> And six, he said, ooh, this is amateurish, even for Wild Thornberry's fan fiction. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 